Cannibal Island by Nicholas Worth, read to you by Carter Banks. Supposed to be on. Chapter One: A Grandiose Plan. In early February 1933, Geinrich Iagoda, the head of the Ogpu, and Matvey Berman, the head of the Gulag, presented Stalin with a vast plan for deporting millions of anti-Soviet elements in the cities and the countryside to Western Siberia and Kazakhstan. They explained that the experience acquired over the preceding three years, during which more than two million kulaks had been deported, made it possible to move on to a new, much more extensive effort to deport all the elements polluting the socialist society currently being constructed. In 1933 and 34, a million elements were to be settled in western Siberia, as many in Kazakhstan. Six categories were targeted. One, kulaks, who had not yet been dekulakized in the course of the preceding years. Two, peasants, including those who had joined the Kolkhozis, who were sabotaging the state's procurement plans and other politico-economic campaigns undertaken by the state. Kulaks who are hiding in the ferns, firms, and workplaces, or escaping from the countryside. Four, individuals expelled in the context of cleaning up the USSR's western frontiers. Five, urban, elements refusing to leave cities in the context of passportization. And six, individuals whom the courts and the Ogpu special jurisdictions had sentenced to terms of less than five years, with the exception of elements particularly dangerous from a social standpoint of view. All these elements deported as labor colonists, a new label, would have the same status as the Kulaks, deported in 1930 to 1931. Labeled special settlers, they would be deprived of their civil rights, put under house arrest in a labor village, and put to special and specially harsh use within the economic state structures responsible for exploiting the timber, mining, and agricultural resources of the Soviet Far East. According to Geinrich Iagoda's plan, 75% of the labor colonists, that is, about one and a half million people, were to work on farms and in the forests within two years. They were supposed to have freed the state from any expense for their support and begun producing merchandise that would allow the state to recover the expenses incurred in the operation of deportation and settlement of the contingents. The rest of the some 500,000 people were to work in the sectors of fishing, crafts, mining, and mining, while at the same time conducting a small side operation in order to feed themselves. To ensure the success of this deportation colonization, which was intended to bring into production at least a million hectares of virgin land 1,000 labor villages at the rate of one village for every 2,000 elements, or about 500 families, would be built. Each village would consist of 100 living units of 650 square feet each, sheltering 20 people, each deportee, thus being allotted 27 square feet of living space. During the first year, baths and infirmary a hygienic station for removing lice and other parasites, stables, a garage for machinery, were to be constructed. During the second year, a school, a cafeteria, a reading room, a store, and so on. For the construction of these labor villages, the managers of the Ogpu and the Gulag estimated that they would need 3,385,000 cubic meters of wood, 10,288 metric tons of iron and sheet metal, 
6,929 metric tons of nails, 2,591 square meters of glass and other materials. These labor villages, which differed only in name from special villages, to which de Kulakai's persons had been sent over the preceding three years, were to be administered by a Czechist commander with very broad powers. Some 3,250 of these Czechist commanders and assistants were to be recruited along with 5,700 million or militiamen, um, 1,000 technicians, 500 agronomists, and 470 physicians and healthcare officers. The whole administrative police and economic management of the labor villages would be the exclusive responsibility of main management, main managerial office especially created to run the labor villages. The most delicate problem the head of the Ogpu and the head of the Gulag acknowledged is the transportation of the human contingents and equipment, construction materials, livestock and tools, the food supply, z authorized to ensure the contingent's survival from the point where the rail lines or waterways end to the places assigned for the contingents, residents, and the economic implementation. Since these places are all situated in practically uninhabited regions, we cannot count on local means of transportation. Preliminary estimates drawn up by our offices set the needs, so far as transportation goes, at 2,416 trucks on the basis of a daily transportation of three metric tons of freight over a distance of 250 kilometers round trip per day, 90,000 horses, considered that one horse should be able to plow 10 hectares and that in addition to this work, the horses will be used to transport wood, 1,200 tractors to be used both for agricultural work and for transport transporting freight and contingents. The plan presented by Iagoda and Berman ended with a long list of expenses and the contributions in cash and in kind to be asked from half a dozen ministries and other state committees. The total expense described as absolutely minimal based on the experience acquired during the operation of deportations and accommodation of the special settlers in 1930 to 31, but in absolute numbers, truly grandiose, since it, since it covers no less than the settlement of two million almost completely deprived individuals in virgin territories hundreds of kilometers away from the railway was estimated at 1,394 million rubles. The highest officials in this repressive system were probably aware of the enormity of the sum requested and the grandiose scope of the project envisioned. This is shown by a few concluding lines typed in capital letters. The sum of these monetary expenses, construction materials, livestock, means of transportation and food supplies for people and animals committed to the project is so grandiose that a special committee must be set up to refine the needs and plans for the deportation and settlement of the contingents. To understand the meaning, place, and scope of this grandiose plan, we must briefly recall the context at the beginning of 1933. The situation had been very tense since the summer of 1932. In order to guarantee large-scale exports of grains and other agricultural products that would make it possible to import the equipment required for accelerated industrialization in the country, the party leadership once again raised the targets for obligatory deliveries imposed on the Kolkhozis, as well as on the individual peasants, despite the fact that a poor harvest was predicted, and that many reports from Siberia and Kazakhstan mention isolated areas where the masks, where there are problems with food supply, a formula that pointing towards a coming, a formula that masks a far more dramatic reality, genuine shortages pointing toward a coming famine. 
1932 procurement campaign begun in July was stalled in mid-October. Only 15 to 20 percent of the planned obligatory deliveries from the from the main grand grain producing regions of the country had come in. The peasants, often with the complicity of the Kolkhozis management, used all kinds of strategic stratagems to avoid delivering part of the harvest to the state. Thefts out of the collective harvest multiplied despite thefts out of the harvest multiplied despite the promulgation in August 1932 of a draconian law punishing theft of social property by 10 years of forced labor in camps or the death penalty. Wheat was buried in pits, hidden in black granaries, ground in the homemade hand mills, and stolen during transportation or weighing. What was particular, particularly disturbing for the Stalinist ruling elite was the solidarity many Kolkhoz managers showed with the people they were supposed to be managing, and even overt opposition to the state's procurement plans on the part of a certain number of local party and Soviet officials, especially in great agricultural regions that were more heavily levied, such as Ukraine, the Kuban, and the Volga area. In order to put an end to this resistance in 1932, the highest level of the party leadership, the Politburo, sent two extraordinary committees to Ukraine and to, North, to the North Caucasus. One of these committees was headed by Vyacheslav Molotov, the other by Lazar Kaganovich. Kaganovich. Thousands of Ogpu agents and party plenipotentiaries, plenipotentiaries, yeah. Um, thousands of Ogpu agents and the party plenipotentiaries were mobilized and dispatched from urban to rural areas in order to compensate for the failures of the local communist authorities. During the summer of 1932, the country was overtaken by a climate of extreme violence that were called the worst aspects of the dekulakization campaign of early 1930. Hundreds of thousands of saboteurs of the procurement plan were arrested. The repression was so excessive that it sometimes lost all meaning. One of many similar reports on the situation, addressed by an official from grain-producing region of Lower Volga to his superiors in early 1933, bears eloquent testimony to this fact. Arrests and searches are carried out by anyone at all. Members of the rural Soviet, emissions of all kinds, members of the shock brigades, any Komosol who isn't too lazy. According to the calculations made by the former assistant prosecutor in the district, Comrade Vasiliev, Vasiliev over the past year, 15% of adult population has been victim of one kind of repression or another. If to that we add that in the course of the past month, about 800 farmers have been expelled from the Kolkhozis, you'll have some idea of the scope of the repression in this district. If we exclude cases in which repression is justified, it has to be said that the efficacy of the repressive measures in constantly diminishing is constantly diminishing, since when they go beyond a certain threshold, it becomes difficult to carry them out. Yesterday, I met a large number of Kokosians who had been expelled from the Kolkos at the beginning of February, and then taken back at the end of the month. Expelling people from the Kolkos no longer has any effect. It's almost the same with criminal prosecutions. In February, more than 4,000 persons were convicted in the district. All the prisons are jamming full. The Bolshevo prison is holding five times as many people as it was planned for and at Elon, the district prison is currently holding 610 people. 
Over the past month, the Bolshevo prison returned to Ilan 78 convicts, for 48 of whom were under the age of 10. 21 were immediately released. What effect on the population can be produced by our extremely repressive laws and judges when we know that at the prosecution's suggestion, 120 persons sentenced to two years and more imprisonment for sabotaging the procurement campaign have had to be set free because of overcrowding of the prisons and have gone home. To close my remark on this method, the only one in use here, the method of force, a few words about the individual peasants with regards to whom everything is done to discourage them from sowing and producing sowing. The individual peasant has an enemy, he's an enemy of the Soviet power, and so he can be treated however one wants. That's the opinion of the local officials regarding this question. The following, exa following example shows how terrorized the individual peasants are. In Mortsy, an, an individual peasant who had nonetheless met his planned target 100% came to see the comrade Fomichev, the president of the district's execution committee, and asked to be deported. For, in any event, he explained, you can't live under these conditions any longer. Similarly, exemplary is the petition signed by 16 individual peasants of the rural Soviet of Alexandrov, in which these peasants asked to be asked to be deported outside their region. Mass labor is non-existent. The only form of mass labor is the assault. Seeds, funds, livestock, raising are taken by assault. People launch an assault on work. Nothing is now done without an assault. You can no longer count all the shock brigades. The latter usually consists of a district official a member of the rural Soviet, a team leader, and two or three Kolkhozians. They attack at night for nine or ten in the evening until dawn. They attack places as follows. The shock brigade, using a hut as its headquarters, convokes one after another, another all the people who have not fulfilled one or another obligation or plan and convinces them by various means to honor their obligations. In this way, each person on the list is attacked, and this goes on all night. The Kolkhozians have become so accustomed to this practice that they no longer do anything without a shock brigade. Thanks to assaults, the procurement plan was completely fulfilled at the beginning of 1933. But at what cost? In, in the producing regions most heavily leveled, the Kolkhozis were able to meet the targets only by giving up their seed stock, their last reserves that allowed them to provide for the next harvest and give them emergency aid to starving Kolkhozians. Starting in 1933, shortages and then famine swept over a large part of Ukraine, the North Caucasus and the Volga region. It was in this context that an important plenary meeting of the Central Committee, a major annual session bringing together the party's leading officials took place in Moscow, January 7th through 12th, 1933. On the agenda were especially the balance sheet for the first five-year plan and the future outlook. Despite a particular particularly alarming situation in the agricultural sector and an overheating of industrial investment, all the political officials, including the leaders of the Ukrainian Communist Party, some of whom had tried to resist Moscow's pressure, celebrated the triumph of socialism and the spectacular success of the first five-year plan carried out in four years and three months. In his speech, Stalin developed a new theory, which can be summed up in a simple idea. With the triumph of socialism and the liquidation of the exploiting classes, opposition did not disappear, 
they took the different forms, defeated the enemies of socialism, no longer acted overtly, masked, veritable, mutants. They were carrying on a particularly vicious war of sabotage that could take forms that were unexpected and difficult to recognize. Some would carry out their sabotage within the Kolkos itself. Others would leave the sabotage, would leave the Kolkos in large numbers and spread false rumors to discredit collectivized farming, while still others would infiltrate factories or major construction sites in order to carry out acts of sabotage. Weakened, the debris of the exploiting classes would seek to ally themselves with the declasse elements, criminals, and other marginal groups. Henceforth, criminality and social deviance would constitute the chief threat to the construction of socialism. At the very time this plenary session was taking place, the exodus of peasants from areas affected by the famine was growing. The Ogpu's regional directors were certain that all these departures were carefully organized by counter-revolutionary organizations. In one week, our services have arrested 500 hardened agitators who were urging the peasants to leave, wrote Vesolod Bolitsky, the head of the Ukraine's political police, to Gynrich Yagoda. On January 22nd, Stalin composed in the name of the party's central committee and the government a secret directive ordering that an end be put to the massive exodus of peasants fleeing Ukraine and the North Caucasus on the pretext of going to look for bread. The Central Committee and the Council of the People's Commissionaries, Stalin wrote, has proof that this exodus from Ukraine was organized by enemies of the Soviet power, by socialist revolutionaries and the Polish agents for propaganda purposes in order to discredit through the intermediary of peasants feeling toward regions of the USSR, North Ukraine, the Kolkhozian system in particular, and the Soviet system in general. The same day, Iagoda sent the Ogpu's regional directors a circular ordering that special patrols be set up, especially in railway stations and on highways, to intercept all runaways coming from Ukraine and the North Caucasus. After filtering the intercepted individuals, the Kulak and the counter-revolutionary elements, individuals propagated counter-revolutionary rumors regarding alleged food shortages, and all those who refused to return home would be arrested and deported to labor villages, or, for the most hardened among them, dispatched to a camp. The other runaways would be sent home, a measure that condemned them to certain death in villages that were suffering from famine and had been left entirely to their fate, without the slightest aid in securing food. As early as the following day, January 23rd, the operation seeking to prevent starving people from fleeing and from spreading news about famine denied by the authorities was completely by directives suspending the sale of train tickets to peasants. In the course of the last week of January, some 25,000 refugees were arrested. A report drawn up with two months a report drawn up two months after the operation began mentioned more than 225,000 persons apprehended. Although the great majority of the peasants intercepted were sent home, tens of thousands of them were interned in improvised, filtering centers while, cre while waiting to be deported as labor colonists. Also waiting to depend also waiting to, to be deported were tens of thousands of other peasants and also minor rural officials arrested since the end of 1932 for sabotage of the procurement campaign. 
Simultaneously, vast police operations were launched in January, February 1933 in the western border regions from the western Ukraine to Belarus and also in Karelia on the border between Finland and the USSR. Since the great peasant insurrections that had taken place in the spring of 1930, the frontier districts of western Ukraine, which bordered on Poland, were considered to be layers of pet petaliorians. Petliorians. In the pay of the Polish government, Stalin's obsession with the Polish enemy was permanent, as it's shown, for example, by his directive of January 22, 1933, cited above. In a few weeks, the Ogpu arrested in the borderland of western Ukraine some 9,500 persons, most of them peasants, described as kulaks, and accused of belonging to the Petliurian Polish insurrectional organizations. Similar operations led to the arrest of 3,500 persons in the border districts of Belarus. Finally, more than 2,000 persons against most of them peasants, again, most of them peasants, were arrested in Karelia on the pretext that they belonged to insurrectional cells set up by the Finnish general staff. For the, for the head of the Ogpu, the operations launched in early 1933 obviously constituted only the first stage of a broad cleansing of the western borderlands, which explains the inclusion of the contingent of individuals expelled in the framework of cleaning, cleansing the USSR's western frontiers as one of the six categories targeted by major deportation by the major deportation plan of February 1933. The conjunction of all these repressive campaigns led to massive congestion in the prisons, especially in areas where the operation of agricultural collectivization or collection had been areas where the conjunction of all these repressive campaigns led to massive congestion in the prisons, especially in areas where the operation of agricultural collection had been the harshest. Ukraine, the North Caucasus, along the Volga, and in the Black Earth. Since the establishment of labor camps and special villages for relocated peasants, the prisons whose maximal capacity was on the order of 180,000 inmates, commonly took in inmates commonly took in prisoners and sentenced to short terms, less than three years and arrested individuals who were awaiting judgment starting in the summer of 1932. Under the impact of the massive arrests connected with the procurement campaign, which was particularly tense, the number of people incarcerated increased exponentially, reaching the enormous figure of 800,000 in the spring of 1933. In February 1933, Nikolai Krylenko, the People's Commissar in the Justice Department, proposed to decongest the prisons and to settle several hundred thousand inmates in labor villages. At the time of March 1933, the Politburo approved Krylenko's proposal. Priority was to be given to prisons in Ukraine, the North Caucasus, the central area of the Black Earth and the Lower Volga, all regions where the concentration of inmates was such that it could at any time lead to serious disturbances of the public order since the overcrowded prisons were scarcely guarded and the prisoners received ridiculously scant rations 
at the very moment when famine was spreading rapidly in the countryside and in the cities. Over the following two months, 57,000 inmates sentenced to terms of more than three years were to be transferred to labor camps. 83,000 inmates serving lesser terms were to be deported to labor villages with the same status as the Kulaks deported during the preceding years. In reality, these transfers represented only the first stage of a larger process that was to expand considerably in the course of 1933. Naturally, this policy of decongesting the prisons was also applied to places of detention in large cities affected by, by the passportization of the urban population begun in 1933, January. In connection with this policy, hundreds of thousands of undesirable elements were driven out of the cities and many of them were deported to labor villages. The passportization of the urban population, a bureaucratic and police operation of unexampled breadth, in a little more than a year, no less than 20, no less than 27 million city dwellers received a passport, which was to replace all other attestations of identity previously delivered by the most diverse authorities, had several objectives. The first objective was to control migratory movements and to limit the immense rural exodus triggered by the forced collectivization of the countryside. The massive influx into the cities of millions of peasants fleeing the second serfdom threatened the whole system of rationing for the urban population that had been laboriously set up since 1929. At the beginning of 1930, some 26 million city dwellers had a claim on these rations. By the end of 1930, the number of the claimants rose to almost 40 million. The second objective was to better identify individuals to establish with exactitude their social position in a society where up to that point there had been no standardized document of identity. The use of an interior passport having been rejected in 1917 as one of the most odious legacies of the czarist regime. In order to prove their identities, Soviet citizens could present a birth certificate, a certificate provided by the Soviet of their place of residence, a professional trade union or a party card, a certificate of residence provided by the cooperative of their apartment building or any other official document delivered by a government office. The third objective was to cleanse Moscow, Leningrad, and the other great urban centers of the USSR of superfluous elements not connected with production or administrative work, as well as kulaks, criminals, the other antisocial and socially dangerous elements. This measure significantly was almost to affect the main reports frequented by nomenclatura, by the nomenclatura, it's in italics. Soshi and Tuapse on the Black Sea and the Spas of the Caucasus, Mineraline Vodi Kislodadisk. The passport. Iagota emphasized is the first and chief line of social defense against criminals and socially harmful elements. The idea of purifying cities, especially Moscow and Leningrad, the strategic Loki of power by cleansing them of their anti-social elements, also designated by the terms parasites, declasse, socially dangerous and socially harmful, recurrently appears in Bolshevist discourse and practice, even in the years of the new economic policy, NEP, which were marked by a relative relaxation of political and social tensions. 
What did the nation of social dangerousness mean in Bolshevist political culture? The term began to appear explicitly in 1924 when a secret revolution resolution passed on March 24th of that year by the Soviet state's highest authority, the Central Executive Committee of the USSR, authorized a special jurisdiction, the OGPU's special conference to ban, exile, expel outside the country, or put in a concentration camp for a maximum term of three years any socially dangerous individual. Such persons were defined as those who had been found guilty or suspected of crimes of state, counter-revolutionaries, activities, larceny, counterfeiting, certain individuals without fixed occupation and not engaged in productive work, such as professional gamblers, wheeler dealers, pimps, drug dealers, hardened speculators, hardened speculators, and all individuals who are socially dangerous because of their past activities. That is, who had at least twice been found guilty of crimes and or who had been arrested at least four times because of their suspected involvement in crimes against goods or persons. This text is remarkable in several respects. respects. Not only because of its very elastic definition of social dangerousness, which went beyond the well-known amalgamation carried out at the beginning of the regime of political offenders and non-political offenders, but also because of its deterministic vision of social dangerousness as situated in the past and present history of hardened situated hardened recidivists connected with the crime world, a vision very different from the utopian approach fashionable in certain judicial and pedagogical circles that had preached the redemption of the criminal through labor. Until the end of the 1920s, the impact of this law remained relatively limited, at least on the scale of the, of the repressions that would be carried out during the following decade. As early as summer of 1924, however, the Ogpu's new progress the Ogpu's new pre-regratives, pre-regogatives, were applied to some 4,500 socially dangerous elements expelled from Moscow and Leningrad upon completion of a vast police roundup. Two years later, in May 1926, Felix Zerajinsky sent his assistant, Heinrich Yagoda, an ambitious program for cleaning up the capital. It is necessary to cleanse Moscow of its parasitical elements. I've asked Palker to collect all the available documentation concerning the creation of files on Moscow residents with regard to this problem. For the moment, I haven't received anything from him. Don't you think that within the Ogpu, a special colonization department should be created, financed by special fund drawn from confiscations? The parasitical and socially dangerous elements in our cities, including their families, have to be used to populate the country's inhospitable areas in accord with a plan prepared beforehand by the government. We must at all cost cleanse our cities of the hundreds of thousands of parasites that are flourishing there and eating us alive. The Ogpu must grapple with this problem with the greatest energy. Analogous plans for cleansing cities of their socially dangerous elements or parasites, beggars, vagabonds, homeless children, minor delinquents, speculators, traffickers, and also recidivist criminals, were drawn up in various provincial cities in Leningrad in 1926 
in Karakov and Odessa in 1927. In the main Siberian cities, Novosibirsk, Tomsk, and Omsk in 1928 and 29. Nonetheless, until the end of the 1920s, the number of socially dangerous elements banished by the decree of an Ongpu special jurisdiction restraint remained relatively modest on a national scale. About 11,000 in 1927, 28,000 in 1929. Of this number, the political offenders represented a small minority between 20 and 25 percent of the exiles. Most of the latter being non-political offenders. In reality, the banishment and exile of socially dangerous elements raised more problems than it solved. Under the current circumstances, in 1927, an official in the Interior Ministry wrote, The exile of socially dangerous elements, far from obtaining its goal, is, providing harmful, is proving harmful to public order. Its only result is to shift those elements from one province to another. In general, socially dangerous elements are unable to find work in their place of exile and so they immediately return to their criminal or suspect activities, rejoining the army of local criminals whose ranks they further strengthen, transforming whole districts into zones in which Soviet power becomes incapable of maintaining public order. However, in late 1932, confronted by the growing chaos resulting from the influx of millions of peasants, fleeing collectivization, and besieging the large cities, the authorities decided to finally implement, within the framework of the policy of the passportization of the urban population, the ambitious program of cleansing Moscow. Felix Dzerisky had recommended in 1926, but this program of identifying individuals was now to be far broader and more systematic, including expulsion of undesirable elements and, in some cases, their deportation to special villages. On December 28, 1932, Pravda published the decrees which the Politburo had ratified on the preceding day, instituting an internal passport, henceforth obligatory for Soviet citizens over the age of 16 who are permanent residents of the cities or the workers' housing complexes or were active in transportation of certain major construction projects considered to be strategic. The passport holder had to present his document at the local police station in his place of residence in order for it to be truly registered. Only registration, propiska, validated the passport thus setting up a double monitoring of the passport holder's identity and legal place of residence. The operations of passportization were to be carried out first in the cities of Moscow, Leningrad, Kharkov, Kiev, Odessa, Minsk, Rostov-on-the-Don, Vladikavkaz, Makhidgorskos, and Vladivostokov. In these cities, designated as subject to special regi regime, the operation ways was to proceed by stages, beginning with people employed in firms and ending with the non-organized population, that is, those who had no strong connection or no connection at all with a workplace, a population that was a priori suspicious in the eye of the authorities. A secret directive defined seven vaguely delimited categories of individuals to whom passports should be refused in these special regime cities. One, individuals not working in production or an institution and not engaged in some form of socially useful labor, 
with the exception of retirees and the handicapped. Two, Kulaks and de Kulakized individuals who had fled the place to which they had been deported, including those who were working in a firm or Soviet institution. Three, individuals who had come from the countryside or another city after January 1st, 1931, without a formal invitation issued by a firm or Soviet institution, and currently without employment, or who are employed but are clearly good-for-nothings, or who had been fired in the past because they had disturbed production. Four, individuals who had been stripped of their civil rights, lichensti. Five, individuals who have been sentenced to, de to deprivation of their freedom or exile, as well as all antisocial elements maintaining relationships with criminals. Six, refugees of foreign origin, with the exception of political refugees. Seven, family members of individuals designated above and living in the same household. Persons to whom a passport had been denied were required to leave the city and its environs within 10 days. In the case of Moscow and Leningrad, the operations of passportization included a suburban and rural zone 100 kilometers in diameter. These persons were, were authorized to settle in any other local locality not subject to the special regime to implement the population's passportization the government created a new general department of the militia directly under the ogpu more than 12,000 additional police officers were hired passport offices were set up in each firm government agency and local police station as might be imagined the issuance of passports gave a rise to countless abuses and irregularities, given the vagueness of the definition of the categories of people considered undesirable. During the first two months of the passportization campaign, March to April 1933, 70,000 persons who had applied for a passport were refused and had to leave Moscow. In Leningrad, more than 73,000 refusals were registered. As one Ogpu official, G. Prokofiev, the head of the militia, noted, this left unresolved the problem of the enormous number of declasse and socially dangerous elements living illegally in Moscow and Leningrad and polluting these cities. When the passportization operation was announced, these individuals, knowing perfectly well that they would not be issued a passport, did not spontaneously present themselves in the passport offices and instead hid in attics, sheds, cellars, gardens, etc. In order to capture and immediately and permanently expel all these individuals, the passport offices special militias operating under the aegis of the inspector of the relevant sector checked the lists kept by concierges and building superintendents. Make the rounds of the barracks for seasonal workers, places where unsavory elements hang out, illegal overnight shelters, attics, cellars, and conduct roundups in train stations, markets, bazaars, and other populous places in order to extirpate the de classe elements, beggars, and thieves. Thanks to these operational steps, Prokofiev concludes 85,937 individuals living in Moscow without a passport, along with 4,776 individuals living in Leningrad without a passport, had been arrested and sent to camp, were deported to a special labor village between March and July 1933. Individuals arrested without a passport were subject to a particularly 
summary administrative procedure. Within 48 hours, the sector inspector sent a list of the persons arrested to a special police committee called Pasportenia Troika, whose sole task was to deal in extru ec <laughs> whose sole task was to deal with in an ex in extrajudicial manner with matters connected with passportization. These committees were authorized to sentence offenders without having to summon those who had violated passport laws to several kinds of penalties. Immediate expulsion with a prohibition on, resident, on residing in 30 cities. Deportation to a special village where they would be under house arrest or being sent to a labor camp for a maximum term of three years. These penalties were effective immediately and could not be appealed. In reality, many of the people arrested during the police roundups did not even go through these summary procedures and were directly deported after a short stay in a transit prison. This was the case for many individuals deported from Leningrad and Moscow in the framework of the cleansing of the USSR's two largest cities on the occasion of Labor Day, May 1st, 1933. They were sent to Tomsk and then, after a short stay in the largest transit camp for special settlers en route to Siberia, to the island of Nazino. And that is the end of chapter one. For everyone who's just tuning in, this is a... Uh, this is a book about, well, books called Cannibal Island, Death in a Siberian Gulag. And basically, it details in pretty horrific detail um, some really fucked up shit that happened uh, in 1933 to, uh, I think, 37. And um, doesn't have an audio book, so I'm making that right now but I figured I would stream it to y'all while I make this audiobook. So what I'm gonna do is, uh, I'm gonna put this video with the audio and the video that uh, I recorded, put it up on YouTube, BitChute, whatever. So we'll, we'll go chapter by chapter. So tomorrow I'll read chapter two. Um, and for anyone who tunes in tomorrow, they can check out chapter one before they, uh, come to Periscope or Instagram or what have you uh, to continue the story along with me. Uh, so anyway, uh, my Periscope link is uh, in my info. I think it's just like prpc.com slash Carter Bryant Banks. Uh, but yeah, just click that link, follow it, tune back in tomorrow at 9. I will be doing a, a chapter a night every day at 9 p.m. Um, during this quarantine. So thank you guys, all who uh, tuned in. Um, make sure to go to the Periscope because it's more reliable than the, the egg story or whatever. Um, and yeah, appreciate you. Everyone stay safe and don't get the novel coronavirus. Peace. I got to turn off like six phones here. Oh, this one's okay. It's really fucking hot in here. Well, it ends in seven seconds. I'll just let it go.